Hey, what is up, everybody? I'm here to give you guys Season 1, Episode 5 of the Flashback Friday videos. Um, I know it's been a while since I've done this series just because I've been extremely busy. So I'm back doing it again. I never really uh, consistently kept doing this, so I want to make sure that this stays consistent. So every Friday, what's pretty much going to happen is I'm going to uh, review a uh, past professional wrestling show. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, it's all, um, and it, this all, do, all has to do with uh, the stuff that gets released on the network. Every uh, Friday on the network, they release um, a past wrestling show um, evolved around the series. And this series all is obviously all had to do with D-Generation X. That's what all of Season 1 is going to uh, consist of. And yeah, so the, pretty much that's what that, that's going to consist of. And uh, I'm just going to say this, I'm no longer going to be... Uh, doing this in different takes and edit it into one video just because it's very time consuming. I'm just going to do this all in one take. So let's just uh, get right into this video. So in this review, I'll be reviewing WWF In Your House D-Generation X, um, which is a pay-per-view that pretty much um, the WWF around this time was very obsessed with um, uh, the In Your House pay-per-views. Um, I don't know why they were, but they were. This was around the time when the WWF started to have more pay-per-views. Uh, they they kind of started it around 1995, um, and it, it it was a continuation. This was pretty much kind of like the last of the In Your House shows. Um, you know, this wasn't one of the last ones, but um, in 1998 the in your house pay-per-views kind of started to go away which really wasn't necessary to do this many in your house shows so i don't know why they did but they did so let's just get right into this review um and you could see around this time that the wwf really kind of started to launch into the attitude area you could really see that they were started to they really finally fully made that step you know you had um, at Survivor Series, the, Mont the Montreal screw job take place. You had Vince McMahon cut the promo, um, talking about how now we've entered an attitude era. And v Vince McMahon, you finally fully knew, um, was the owner of the WWF. He finally, uh, started to become, started to develop into his heel character. Um, even though it really doesn't play much of a factor on this show, but you could kind of see that that's what was starting to happen. And there were certain stars on this show that you were kind of starting to see we're either going to become huge stars, which I'll get into that, or, um, you know, um, we're starting to become, you know, great mid-card wrestlers. And you could see that the WWF was kind of starting to understand that. Uh, the WWF, I think, finally were in the Attitude Era, and now it was kind of like, what's next? And you could see uh, pretty much by WrestleMania 14, um, they were fully in the Attitude I mean, they they already were fully in the Attitude Era, but that's when the Attitude Era, you really kind of knew they were fully in the Attitude Era once WrestleMania 14 hit. But I'll get into that. Let me get into the show first. Um, so yeah, we had, uh, this show took place actually in Springfield, Massachusetts. I was probably three years old when this show took place. Um, and we had Jerry the Kin Lawler and Jim Ross on commentary for this show. Uh, this was when they were really starting to develop into a team together because Vince McMahon was no longer on commentary with them anymore. And they this was probably um, one of the best pair-ups when it came to a commentary team. You had Jim Ross, who was the babyface, who was a really great play-by-play -play commentator. And you had Jerry the Kim Lala, who was an awesome heel commentator. I don't know if it's the best one of all time, but it's definitely one of the greatest of all time. They really uh, were like... The highlight of the Attitude Era. And I really miss this commentary team. Because nowadays the commentary sucks. And the commentaries was much better around this time. Of, um, uh, in this time of time. And it showed a nice little video package. Kind of showing everything that D-Generation X had accomplished. Because obviously. Uh, this kind of shows that the WWF really wanted to get this faction over. And it was really starting to get over. D-Generation X was the edgy faction. They tried it with every other faction. But it didn't work. And DX got its own pay-per-view out of it. So that was really cool. Um, we had the first match on the show. It was a vacant light heavyweight championship tournament finals match. Uh, too, too sexy Brian Christopher versus Taka Michinoku. Uh, you know, obviously this is the WWF. Um, put it in a new style uh, of wrestling. That was 
um, into its company that's never been brought in before. It wasn't really new. You know, obviously WCW was doing this with the cruiserweight division, so WWF wanted to kind of have a division like the light heavyweight division to kind of compete with the cruiserweight division. Um, and it was kind of a cool because WWF hasn't really been known for this type of style. Um, and, you know, it was cool. And they had this tournament. It started on November 3rd. Um, and was this was the culmination of it. Taka Michinoko defeated Devin Storm. Uh, Devon Storm and Agula um, to, advan to advance to the finals and Brian Christopher defeated Flash Flanagan and Scott Taylor to advance in the finals and Brian Christopher had a pretty easy road to the tournament because um, he ended up winning one of his matches via forfeit and Taka Michinuku had a little bit of a harder road to get here and yeah over, um, over, and obviously they were telling they were trying to kind of tell the story that uh, obviously, he was Jerry the Kin Lawler's son, but Jerry the Kin Lawler would never admit that he was his son. And I thought that was a nice little story uh, line that they had. And this match actually was, uh, you know, um, really good. I thought this was a really good opening matchup. And it was just um, a really good culmination to the tournament. Taka Michinoku hits a drop kick right off the bat. He hits a springboard plancha right outside the ring. Um, and then um, Brian Christopher gets the advantage. He uh, hits a leg drop. He. Uh, Hits a right hand, and then he tries to go off the uh, top turnbuckle and hit a axe handle on the outside. But Taka Michinuku moves out of the way, and, he, and Brian Christopher hits his face right onto the uh, guardrail, which looked he actually it actually cut him open and stuff. I don't know. I think that was legit. Um, so that looked pretty bad. And um, Taka Michinuku then hits a Hurricanewana. He hit he gets him into an armbar. He uh, hits a um, moonsault. And then uh, Jerry the Kin Lawler starts to get concerned for his son, so he goes and checks on him. Taka Michinuku drop kicks him and he bumps into Lawler. Um, he hits a uh, dive on the floor. Uh, Brian Christopher hits a sit down power bomb, and Brian Christopher really starts to, to take control of this matchup. He hits a body slam, a suplex, and um, a wick, um, a, um, a sick neck breaker onto Taka Michinoku. He hits a leg drop, and he keeps. He gets too cocky and keeps uh, not really going for more cocky couplers than anything else. But Taka Michinoku keeps, keeps kicking out of him. And then the finish comes when uh, Brian Christopher goes off the top rope for a leg drop. And he misses and Taka Michinoku hits a Michinoku driver, which is a move that he brought in originally for the win. And he becomes the, very, the new and very first uh, light heavyweight champion. And he gets congratulated by some Hall of Famers like... Um, uh, Pat Patterson, Jared Briscoe, and somebody else I didn't really know his name. And Taka Michinoku uh, was the first ever light heavyweight champion. Obviously, I think it made sense to go uh, with Taka Michinoku. Obviously, this kind of launched off Jerry the Kin Lawler kind of feuded with him, which was weird. Um, and yeah, it launched off the light heavyweight division, which I don't really know if it ever really took off. They had some good matches and stuff, but I don't really think the WWF ever really knew. It always comes with... The WWF always gets like a light heavyweight or a cruiserweight division. It always ne they never really know what to do with it, so I don't know why they keep trying to do it, but whatever. I mean, it's an example now with the cruiserweight division that they have. Um, and as for both where both these superstars went, um, obviously we know that um, what's his name. Um, Brian Christopher became Grandmaster Sexy, and he became um, part of the like uh, part of the tag team. Too cool, and they became like a really good team. Ironically enough, Brian Christopher I think had a better career than um, at least in WWE than Taka Michinoku did. And as for Taka Michinoku, he became the longest reigning uh, light heavyweight champion in WWF history, and I think he lost the title. I don't even know when he lost it. He lost the title. Um, at Judgment Day in your house in 1998, and then he like, you know, never became champion again. You know, because pretty much the light heavyweight division kind of um, really didn't go anywhere after that. And then he became the number the the um, a member of the faction Kai and Tai. And now he's uh he he just left the WWF in um 2002, and, well 2001 actually. And now he does indie dates. He uh. Now is working for uh, uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling. He's been working there since 2007, uh, at least from what I'm reading off right here. 
And yeah, uh, as for Grant, where, where uh, Brian Christopher is, I messed up the name. Like I said, he became Grandmaster Sexay. Uh, now he he recently uh, now he does I think indie dates, uh, but he has wrestled some matches in WWE most recently uh, at NXT uh, Arrival. So that so yeah, um, occasionally you will see two cool. Um, you know, in WWE. I have a feeling actually we'll probably see him on the 25th anniversary of Monday Night Raw, actually. Um, which would be cool. Uh, but yeah, overall, this match I thought was actually really good. This was probably the the best match of the show. Wasn't my, wasn't like my favorite like segment or match of the show, but this probably actually was the best match on the show. So I'll probably give it three and a quarter. St- um, I'll probably give it um, uh, three and a quarter stars. Actually, it's this match. It's it's actually tied with the best match of the show. This patch match probably was the best match on the show. Um, so yeah, that's what I think. Uh, then we had the next match. It was um, Jesus Castillo Jr., Jose Estrada Jr., and Menguzo Menguzo Perez Jr. with Savio Vega, who all made up Los Puriquas, versus the Disciples of Apocalypse. Um, Obviously, this feud was taking place. Um, I have talked about this feud before. This pu- feud pretty much has been going on uh, since I started doing this series. Um, you know, you had Los Boricuas who stole the bicycles of the Disciples of Apocalypse. So they pretty much have been feuded ever since. They had matches and, uh, you know, it was back and forth. It was pretty much uh, trying to get these factions over, but it didn't work. Uh, I don't know what this was like. You know, um, slowly uh, the uh, new generation era kind of going away because these guys kind of were a part of that and really weren't all that good, I, at least in my opinion. And the referee ejects Savio Vega, so it's a fair fight. Uh, the, the Disciples of Apocalypse destroy uh, Los Buriquas in the beginning, and um, I believe um, his name is... Uh, Perez goes to go off the top rope onto, uh, I believe his name was Skull. It was either Skull or Lightball. The commentators really didn't know either. And he hits the move. He hits like an axe handle. And Perez takes out his knee. So I we were supposed to have thought he was actually injured. I actually thought he was injured. Um, but uh, I was getting suspicious because... Nobody came and checked on this guy, so I don't know what, um, I don't know, so I was getting suspicious, like, is he really hurt, are they going to use this in the finish? Uh, well, Savio Vega comes out, and he tries to, uh, and, um, get himself into this matchup, but, um, the referee doesn't buy it, um, so, uh, Los Boricuas continue to dominate, uh, either Skull or 8-Ball, and then, um, Chains gets the hot tag, and he, and he hits a Death Valley driver, um, onto um, one of the Los Boricuas, and then Perez, we find out, was faking the injury. He hits a um, s- flip leg drop to the back of the head, and then um, one of the Los Boricuas gets the pinfall for the win, so Los Boricuas goes over. Uh, this was a pretty average match. Um, I didn't mind the finish too much, actually, because if this happened today, um, the probably the baby faces still wouldn't have gone over, and no one would have gotten over, so... I'm actually I actually like the finish. I thought it was uh, clever, uh, but this match was pretty average. Both teams were average. Um, this match I would probably give uh, two stars. It was just really an average six man tag. Um, and as for Los Boricuas, um, if I'm not mistaken, I'm gonna look to see where these guys are. Um, Jose Carsulio Jr. Um, He is, uh, from what it says here, um, apparently he, in two th- the last we know about him is in November in 2012, he was the uh, general manager of a company called, um, in, in Puerto Rico called um, PRWA, and um, he's the current champion. Um, but I don't... Um, but that's the last of 2012. It doesn't say what else is, where else he is at the moment. 
As for um, Jose Estrada Jr., um, last appearance was in TNA, but we haven't really heard much from him since then. Uh, Perez Jr., um, last we heard of him, he was he's doing indies. He, um, in 2014, wrestled for the WWC, which stands for the World Wrestling Council. Um, but we haven't heard, but that was like in, two, that was, uh, in 2014. And Savio Vega, I think, is still doing, uh, indie dates. Um, yeah, he's still, in, he's still doing the, um, indies. As for the Disciples of Apocalypse, I'll break down each member. Um, 8-Ball is, um, retired. Um, Chains is Indies. Um, and Skull is also retired. Uh, he was actually a part of the, uh, Harris Brothers, actually. Um, he's wrestled in, uh, he wrestled in w, uh, WF and WCW. So, uh, no, yeah, no one really went far from this angle. Um, then we had, uh, the next match. Well, next we had an interview with Butterbean. And Butterbean, pretty much I'll just kind of explain this. Butterbean was feuding at the time with Marvelous Mark Mello. Um, Mark Mello uh, pretty much cl uh, was an amateur boxer. And he claimed that he could be, uh, knock out Butterbean. So he c continued to talk trash to him. Uh, which is kind of the whole premise of the feud. Um, and Butterbean was like this big boxer that you know, uh, kind of got sick. Because this is at the time where they started to do the whole heel turn with Mark Mello and Sable. Where uh, Mark Merrick treated Sable like crap. And, um, yeah, um, it was uh, a pretty dumb feud, actually. I liked the Mark Merrill Sable stuff, but this I could have done without. They were clearly trying to get some publicity because this guy was a boxer at the time. And they were trying to, WWF was trying to get some mainstream publicity. Well, they did, but not with this guy. They did it with a different boxer who really wasn't boxing anymore. Um... So Butterbean gets interviewed saying that he's going to knock out uh, Mark Mello. And another story they tried to play along was B Butterbean had had a boxing match the night before. And Sable ha um, had accompanied him ringside. Obviously because WWF was trying to get mainstream publicity. So Sable was asked who she's gonna, uh, whose corner she's going to be in. And she said that uh, she's going to be... Her heart's going to be in the right place. And Mark Mello comes up and says that... Uh, you know, and B's really rude to her and says that she can't, that he said she couldn't do an interview. And he said that this is his moment and he's going to knock out Butterbean tonight. Then, um, and as for the, uh, where the interview guys have gone, um, obviously the interviewers were Doc Hendricks, who went on to become Michael P.S. Hayes backstage and he has a role backstage now. Uh, Michael Cole, who's now the lead commentator pretty much in WWE, mainly on Monday Night Raw since the, because of the brand split. And then later on, we it was also James E. Cornette, who is now Jim Cornette, who has his own wrestling podcast and stuff. Um, and he's very famous when it comes to his shoot interviews and stuff. So then we had the... Uh, they called it a tough guy match, but it was pretty much a boxing match. Uh, Marvelous Mark Mello with Sable... Um, and his trainer, Ray Rinaldi, versus Butterbean with his trainers, um, um, it doesn't say, but pretty much whoever his trainers were. This was bad, um, I didn't care about this at all, um, this was not really much of a boxing match, uh, the first, uh, this pretty much went, uh, they were gonna have four, um, two minute rounds, and, um, yeah, uh, the first round, pretty much uh, Butterbean owns Mark Mello, but they didn't really do anything to each other. The The second round, uh, Mark Mello attacks him before it even happens. He kicks him. He kicks Butterbean in the back of the head. He chokes him with uh, the wind rope, and, Butterbe and Mark Mello owns Butterbean in the second round. And then he, um, after the second round's over, um, Mark Mello kicks him in the back, kicks Butterbean in the back of the head. And um, in the second round, Mark Mello had thumb Butterbean in the eye. And, you know, uh, then the th in the third round, Butterbean nearly knocks out uh, Mark Mello. And 
but the round ends before the referee can declare that he's knocked out. So Butterbean's getting in the fourth round. Butterbean's getting really close to knocking out Mark Melo, uh, but but uh, but Mark Melo low blows him, which causes a disqualification, and Butterbean goes after him. Uh, this was bad. I didn't care about this at all. Uh, this gets this gets one star. This was terrible. Um, and as for where these uh, wrestlers went, obviously this led to Mark Melo eventually splitting with Sable. It didn't happen quietly on this show, but it happened eventually. And but and Mark Melo now is uh, retired. And Butterbean, I'm assuming, is retired. Um. Actually, I don't think he is retired. Actually, the last the last fight he had was uh in 2011, where he knocked out Dean Storley. Um. So, but he's done like movies and film and stuff. So, th that's what else has gone on with uh Mark Bello. Um, I believe he won the um. Free for all as well, um, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, yeah, so that but this match was but this was bad. Don't I would recommend not watching this. All right, then we had uh, the the artist formerly known as Goldust and Luna Vashon promo. This was when Goldust got like massively weird when he uh, started doing this weird stuff with Luna Vashon, and he pretty much comes out. He was pretty much acting like Prince at this time. He comes out and uh, reads the cat and the, not the cat, and the, green eggs and ham, um, and he reads it like in the most creepiest way ever. Um, it was awesome. And then Luna Vashon stops him and forces him to go to the back, and she has him like locked onto a collar, um, onto a uh, chain. But this was awesome. Um, if you ha you ha go out of your way to see this, because it was awesome. It was great. Um, then, um, as for where they are now, Goldust is still wrestling in the WWE today. He's had short ones here and there, but he's pretty much still wrestling today. And as for where uh, Luna Vashon is, uh, that I don't know, actually. Yeah, this is definitely Luna Vashon. She, um, is unfortunately dead, actually. She died, uh, which is kind of sad. She died in 2009. Actually, 2010, my bad, 2010. Um, but just, but yeah, unfortunately, she's passed away. And then we had the, um, next interview, we had the Legion of Doom get interviewed, and this this is his, this is the story for the WWF Tag Team Championships. Uh, the Legion of Doom had lost the WWF Tag Team Championships to uh, the Road Dog and uh, uh, Badass Billy Gunn, which obviously you know they would become the New Age Outlaws later on. Um, they would this was the slow build up to that, and they obviously would f join DX and stuff like that. And um, Legion of Doom wanted we re uh, wanted revenge uh, and. Animal compares uh, the Legion of Doom to a booger, how he just is going to flick them off. It was a great promo, actually. I know it sound, doesn't sound like that it was, but the way the Legion of Doom presented this promo was awesome. So, we had the match. Um, you know, uh, Road Dog comes out and he's pretty much uh, talking how he's going to defeat the old dinosaurs, the Legion of Doom. This was obviously leading to when they would start doing the whole DX typical catchphrases and... The Legion of Doom keep trying to go after him, but they keep going backstage. So eventually, officials force him to go out there. Legion of Doom attack him. They beat the crap out of um, uh, Road Dog and uh, Badass Billy Gunn in the beginning. Um, and they throw him into the steps, into the guardrail. Uh, they, they drop Road Dog into the guardrail, and they drop Billy Gunn right um, ribs first into the steps. And... Um, Eventually, uh, while the referee's back is turned, um, Road Dog and uh, Billy Gunn uh, cheat. They take like an um, old cooler out that's made of styrofoam and hit, um, I believe, um, 
hawk in the back of the head with it, and they do this twice. They even low blow him, and Low Dog and uh, just Low Dog and uh, Billy Gunn get the heat on uh, Animal for on Hawk for a while. Then eventually Animal gets the hot tag and starts going off on uh, Low Dog and um, Billy Gunn's distracting the referee. Um, Henry O. Godwin comes out and he, uh, when the Legion of Doom go for the um, Tower of Doom, um, Henry O. Godwin hits uh, Hawk with the bucket and Animal starts going to town on everyone with the bucket and um, then eventually uh, the referee sees this and this causes a disqualification. Uh, so Low Dog and, and uh, Billy Gunn win and they retain the WWF Tag Team Championships and... Um, uh, yeah, Legion of Doom are pissed. Um, overall, I thought the match was good. I didn't really care for the finish. So I'm going to give the match probably a three and a quarter star. So like I said, uh, even though I'm giving both of um, the li even the, both the light heavyweight championship match and the WWF tag team championship match the same star ratings, uh, they really don't have the same star ratings just because, uh, like, well, they really aren't. Uh, but I think the light heavyweight championship match is better. Just uh, this match probably would have been better had it not been for the finish. Um, I was actually enjoying this match quite a bit. This, the finish kind of ruined the match. I guess they wanted to build to a rematch, but I didn't really care for the finish. Um, as for where both teams are now, uh, the Legion of Doom obviously um, had some other stints in WWE uh, going forward. Obviously, uh, I always forget which one it is. I think it's... So Hawk has recently passed away, So, but um, Animal, I think, is... But Animal is um, will occasionally come back. I actually would like to see him come back in the uh, um, on the twenty fifth anniversary of Raw. But he's come back to WWE and worked some uh, and did some stuff. He's um, had some. He's uh, teamed up with various other partners, and he's also uh, had some short stints back with WWE. He's been in TNA now and stuff like that. Um, as for, um, the new, e well, Billy Gunn and Road Dog. obviously we know they became the New Age Outlaws, like I said, they joined DX, and they became, like, one of the greatest tag teams of all time, they've had some short months in the Indies, they recently just had a second WWE return, unfortunately now, um, apparently I'm hearing that there's heat between them in real life, you know, uh, but Road Dog um, is the head writer for SmackDown, and Billy Gunn is working the Indies right now. So because he was fired from WWE recently, I don't really. Remember. I think it had to, something to do with like some sort of steroids or something. So it is what it is. Um, and then uh, China and Triple H get interviewed, and this this was building up to the boot camp match between Triple H and Sergeant Slaughter. Uh, this is when the WWF was finally starting to get a. Uh, shorten the Triple H name because they used to just keep calling him Hunter Hurtis Helmsley and they finally realized, well, let's just call the guy Triple H. Um, and that's exactly what happened. It's really weird now to see Triple H and China together knowing that now they have like real, that they, well, they had real heat eventually and everything that happened with China and Triple H and stuff like that. Um, and um, yeah, uh, pretty much uh, when DX came together, the, uh, they continuously... Uh, disrespected uh, the commissioner at the time, Sergeant Slaughter, and Sergeant Slaughter finally wanted to do something about it, so he gave up his commissioner duties for the night, so that way he could take care of Triple H, and a big thing that they built to was the camel, was the uh, Cobra Clutch, you know how when Sergeant Slaughter locks that move in, no one's, able to, no one's able to get out of it unless somebody else pulls him off, which kind of tied into the finish of the match. And I, I like this. And Triple H, you know, continuously disrespects uh, Sergeant Slaughter in this interview, talking about how he bought a survival kick to survive him, and he brings out all this stuff, uh, referencing that Sergeant Slaughter's old. And then he, al then he also, um, you know, says that uh, after this match, he's going to go to his wife, and he can smoke on his pipe, which obviously no, um, no, everyone should know what he's referencing there. Uh, we ha and before the match happens, then Sergeant Slaughter gets interviewed, and he said that he may be old, but he can still fight, and he's here to fight Triple H tonight. And we had this match, and I what I heard that uh, you know the boot camp match Triple H with China versus Sergeant Slaughter. 
when I heard this match was going to go down, I'm like, yeah, this match isn't going to be all that good. And this act this match actually was good. It was a three-star match, nothing fantastic, but I actually liked the match. It was good. I am probably letting a lot of people will, but it was a nice, methodical-paced match. Sergeant Slaughter destroys Triple H in the beginning of this matchup. He has, like, a little nightstick, or whatever you call this, in, um, in the army, and he destroys Triple H with it. He throws him into the steps, and... He destroys Triple H in this match, uh, right in the beginning of this match, just uh, methodically picking him apart, and I and I loved it. It was great. And then Triple H, he goes for the camera clutch. Triple H rolls out of it. He uh, backdrops Sergeant Slaughter over the top turnbuckle, and Sergeant Slaughter takes a nasty spill. Triple H uh, throws Slaughter into the steps. He grabs the wind bell. He actually knocks out the timekeeper, and Sergeant Slaughter fights him off at first, but then Triple H hits him in the back with the wind bell, and Triple H dominates the matchup for a while. He uh, methodically picks apart Slaughter. Slaughter. He gets him into a sleeper hold, but Slaughter turns it into the uh, Cobra Clutch, and China comes in and attacks Slaughter. Um, he uh, she grabs a steel chair. I kind of feel bad calling her he, but she grabs a steel chair, goes to hit Slaughter. Slaughter with it. Slaughter throws powder in her face, and then um, she gets um. He gets Triple H again into a Cobra Clutch, and China low blows Sergeant Slaughter, and she uh, she also takes out the referee doing this, and Triple H then um, hits Sergeant Slaughter with his boot and hits him hits a pedigree on the chair on a steel chair for the win, and Triple H goes over, which made sense because he was the young talent. He should have gone over in this matchup. Sergeant Slaughter didn't have anything to gain from winning. And I think this is the first time they actually used the D Generation X theme song too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I was on this show. It probably wasn't the first time, but it's the first time that I heard it since I've gone back and rewatched these videos. So, uh, but yeah, um, overall I thought this match was good. Three stars. Uh, Triple H definitely benefited from this victory. He needed this victory because uh, he was the young talent. And you know, Sergeant Slaughter. You know, I think uh, shortly after this, um, you know. Um, was relieved of his duties as a commissioner and he um, he occasionally comes back and does like a short stint with the WWE. Uh, Triple H obviously now is uh, went on to become a huge star, uh, multiple time world and WWE champion, multiple time intercontinental champion, European champion. Uh, he, he just became a huge star after this obviously because it had to do with Shawn Michaels getting hurt so he had to kind of lead the DX faction and he did great it. He did great in it. Um, Triple H became so huge that uh, he became known as the Reign of Terror in uh, 2002 to 2005, and you know now he he married the he married Vince McMahon's daughter, and now he uh, is the COO of uh, the WWE, and he runs NXT and stuff like that. Uh, China, unfortunately, uh, when uh, Triple H uh, was cheating on her with Vince McMahon's daughter, kind of fell a little bit. She still, she wasn't uh, really as big of a star as she was. She became women's champion and stuff like that. Uh, but eventually, obviously, she uh, was kind of fired from the WWE. And we didn't really see much of her afterwards. She did, like, indie dates and stuff. She, we, she worked um, a TNA one in 2011, but it didn't really go anywhere. And then uh, China, unfortunately, passed away uh, in 2016. And... Um, it kind of sucks because she she really should have gone to the Hall of Fame while she's still alive. There was absolutely no reason she should have. I understand she did porn and stuff like that, but obviously Triple H had some disdain towards um, China. And uh, the one thing that Triple H always was, I will say, did want was prevented China from entering the Hall of Fame. So, yeah, um, that's what I had to th say about that. Uh, but overall, I still thought this was a good three star match. Then we had um, um, a Jeff Jarrett interview. He was going to wrestle The Undertaker. This was his return to WWF television. Uh, Jeff Jarrett kind of stopped doing the whole Double J gimmick. And he just became, you know said that he was the greatest wrestler of all time, which wasn't true. And this match really was just there as a plot device for Undertaker and Kane. Because the match really was just a two-star match. I'm not really going to break it down. Um, Undertaker was on the verge of victory. Um, and then Kane's thing goes off because this was at the time when Kane debuted. And 
screwed Undertaker out of the first ever Hell in a Cell match against Shawn Michaels because Paul Bear had um, had betrayed the Undertaker and he kept saying that Kane was coming to WWE, well, the, 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 to the WWF at the time, and he finally did. And Kane wanted revenge for the Undertaker burning down his house and killing his family as well as uh, uh, giving him emotional scarring. And the Undertaker refused to fight Kane. He refused to, f- to fight his own flesh and blood. So Kane came out. He choke slammed Jeff Jarrett. And uh, Kane slaps Undertaker in the face. Walks off. Undertaker doesn't do anything because he doesn't want to fight his brother. And then afterwards, after Kane and Paul Bear leave, Jeff Jarrett tries to attack the Undertaker some more because he had been working on the injured leg. And then the Undertaker lays out Jeff Jarrett with a choke slam. He, w- he leaves, and then the referee raises Jeff Jarrett's hand. The winner, because he technically won this match by disqualification since Kane attacked him. And I love this. I thought this was a... Uh, the match really was a two-star match, but the storytelling in this match I thought was great with Kane and Undertaker. This was slowly building up to the match coming up at WrestleMania 14, which the Undertaker would win, and then he would win the blow-off match and the Inferno match, and obviously they had other feuds um, in 2000 um, at SummerSlam when Undertaker unmasked Kane, and then we had the... Uh, then Kane buried the Undertaker alive, um, and then at WrestleMania 20, um, Undertaker squashed Kane, uh, and then um, you know they became tag team champions together uh, in 2001. Actually, um, they became actually of all things WCW tag team champions together, uh, but they were also WWF tag team champions together as well. And then um, they had the final feud together. In 2010, when Kane won the World Heavyweight Championship, put The Undertaker in a vegetative state, and and Kane defeated Undertaker all three times at Night of Champions in, no holds, in a No Holds Barred match, at Hell in a Cell in a Hell in a Cell match, and at Bragging Rights in a um, Buried Alive match, which was their final match together. And then they ha- they recently just had a reunion together um, on the thousandth episode of Raw, and then at Survivor Series. Um, in the 25th anniversary for The Undertaker's career. And um, as for where everybody is now, Jeff Jarrett recently is in rehab because he doesn't know when to put down, uh, when to not stop, when to put down the bottle. Uh, Undertaker um, hopefully is retired. He pretty much became an icon in WWE though. But hopefully he's now retired. He recently just retired at WrestleMania 33. Hopefully, because I'm hearing that, I'm hearing otherwise. Um, I mean, I love The Undertaker and all, but he needs to retire. Um, and Kane is actually still with WWE. Um, whoever would have thought Kane would have lasted as long as he has. Um, after all the crap gimmicks that Kane got put with, that got put with, he, he finally got one that worked. Um, and it was and it was Kane, you know. Um, it worked, and Kane worked. You know, obviously he's uh, his, his, he doesn't have the same gimmick now. Um, he's He's unmasked and then he remasked recently. Well, he remasked in 2011. And now uh, he's done it off and on. And now Kane is running for mayor of Knoxville. But he's now at the Royal Rumble going to be competing in a triple threat match for the uh, WWE uh, Universal Championship. So, yeah, Kane um, has has pretty much... uh, been with the WWE since day one. He's still there to, to this day, and he never really got hurt. He stayed. He uh, was there pretty much uh, the whole way through. And as for Paul Bear, he's recently passed away, but he's come back. He managed Kane, Taker, and stuff like that. Um, so, and did short stints like that. But yeah, this match really was a two star match. Then we had uh, an interview with Mark Henry, and he pretty much just kind of talks about what he's doing there, who he picks to win the Intercontinental Championship match and stuff like that. Obviously, they just recently brought Mark Henry in and you can see where we need an improvement, but, you know, Mark Henry now is just recently retired and he actually stayed there for a while as well. He was World Heavyweight Champion, ECW Champion, um, and European Champion. Then uh, we had the Nation of Domination interview, interview, and this was pretty much the start of the feud uh, between Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock, well, Rocky Maivia in this case, for the uh, Intercontinental Championship. Um, and this was a really good feud. Um, obviously this feud eventually was so good. That it transcended into the main event scene later on. Uh, but obviously you know Stone Cold Steve Austin. Uh, I can't even like begin to describe this match. Um, this was my favorite. Now this was a highlight. Of- this was the highlight of the show for me. This 
was my favorite part of the show. It wasn't the best match on the show, but I thought it was good enough. Um, you know, um, Stone Cold Steve Austin recently had just come back from a, um, a neck injury. He had regained his uh, Intercontinental Championship at Survivor Series. Um, and he had taken out the Nation of Domination, though. And the Nation of Domination wanted to take out Stone Cold Steve Austin. Rocky Maivia wanted to become the Intercontinental Champion. Stone Cold Steve Austin kept laying out each member of the Nation of Domination with the Stone Cold Stunner. And then eventually, uh, Rocky Maivia stole Stone Cold Steve Austin's Intercontinental Championship and claimed it as his own. This was when Rocky Maivia was awesome. You know, they originally brought him in as this lame baby face that everybody hated. And then eventually they turned him here and had him join up with the Nation of Domination. And these, the, both these guys were white heart young talents. Stone Cold Steve Austin, you know, had uh, gained a following by just stunning and kicking everybody's ass because he didn't care. He had won the King of the Wind tournament and started his whole, um, in 1996, and started his whole gimmick. Austin 316, since I just whipped your ass. He had that, you know, great submission match with uh, Bret the Hitman Hoat at WrestleMania 13. Where uh, they did the whole double turn where Bret Hart turned heel and Austin turned face. And he was awesome. Everybody loved Stone Cold Steve Austin. And, you know, this match I thought was a perfect match for these two guys to have. Now, this match was a good three-star match. I think what affected this match was Austin really couldn't take much bumps because he was just recently off neck off of a neck injury. So they didn't want to take any risks. But this still, I thought, really, I still thought this match worked. Stone Cold Steve Austin, you know, Rocky Maivia comes out with... Um, D'Lo Brown, Kama Mustafa, and Farouk of the Nation of Domination. And um, Rocky Maivia then gets on the mic and said that he's going to defend his Intercontinental Championship. And then Stone Cold Steve Austin drives out with, a, um, into, in, in, with an Austin 316 truck. Takes out Rocky Maivia. Um, the Nation of Domination. Beat, and I actually like too how the Rocky Maivia didn't want to be called Rocky Maivia anymore. He wanted to be called The Rock. Because I think the WWF was trying to separate him from the whole, you know, from his father, Peter, Peter Maivia. So I liked that. Um, so then the Nation of Domination start to outnumber Stone Cold Steve Austin. Austin backdrops D'Lo Brown onto the windshield of the, tru um, onto, uh, of the truck. And then he hits a Stone Cold Stunner on it. And then Rocky Maivia starts to take control of Stone Cold Steve Austin early in the matchup. Um, and then while the referees turn, while Austin's on the outside, well, Austin though hits a Luthez press, and then they exchange roll-ups, and then that happens. Uh, Farouk and Kama Mustafa start to beat down Stone Cold Steve Austin. Kama Mustafa tries to hit Austin off the head with a chair, but he misses and accidentally hits uh, Farouk with the chair, which causes him to go right through the windshield. And Austin takes out Kama Mustafa. And then Rocky Maivia continues to take control of uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. He hits a body slam on him. Goes for the people's elbow, which is like the worst finish you'll ever. Austin moves out of the way. Um, goes for the Stone Cold Stunner. Um, Rocky Maivia counters. And um, he uh, takes out Kama Mustafa. Austin takes out Kama Mustafa. And then Austin inadvertently takes out the referee with the Stone Cold Stunner, thinking that it's Rocky Maivia. Rocky Maivia grabs the brass knuckles, goes to hit Austin with him. Austin ducks him, hits a stunner on the Rocky Maivia, covers him. A new referee comes into the win. Austin retains the uh, Intercontinental Championship and wins. Three-star match. Good action. Um, and, yeah, it was just five minutes. He didn't really need to do a whole lot. And, obviously, Austin was really becoming red hot in the WWF. So, obviously, this led to him winning the Royal Rumble. He uh, won the WWF Championship at WrestleMania 14 from Shawn Michaels. And he became the face of the Attitude Era. And, the, obviously, the Rock, or Rocky Maivia, same thing. You know, he was, th these were both, th both these guys became the top two stars in the Attitude Era. They wrestled in main events of WrestleMania of 15, 17, well not 19, but they were, but, but they did wrestle in 19. Austin had his last match at WrestleMania 19. R the Rock became a huge star. Uh, and now he's like the biggest thing in Hollywood. He just recently got his own Hollywood star. Stone Cold Steve Austin's a big star as well. And these two guys just became huge stars in the WWF and these guys were awesome. Um, my uh, top three they're definitely in my top five when it comes to favorite wrestlers of all time obviously top my number one's The Undertaker but they're definitely Austin's number two Rock's number three these guys were awesome um, and I love this match 
Uh, so I pretty much just stay, stayed at Will Austin and Walker went afterwards. As for um, the rest of the nation of uh, domination, D'Lo Brown became a decent mid-card wrestler. He was European champion and stuff like that. Really didn't do a, um, a whole lot, but did enough. Um, and obviously he, I think he's doing like indie stuff now. He was he was just in TNA not that long ago. Uh, Kamu Mustafa went on to become known as the Godfather, uh, where, he became, where he had the whole train, which was awesome. Recently just went into the Hall of Fame, and it was awesome, it was awesome stuff. And then we had Farouk, who became a tag team with uh, Bradshaw, known as the APA, and then became Ron Simmons and says, damn! So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Then we had uh, Ken Shamrock interview, and pretty much this was the start of the feud between Ken Shamrock and Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels, um, you know, uh, just came out of the Montreal screw job, and he was the number one heel in the company. The uh, WWF had signed Ken Shamrock earlier in the year, and he was a huge U UFC fighter. Um, he was the guest referee um, in the um, Austin Brett submission match, and he was a huge star. In the w he was becoming a huge star in the WWF. Uh, the WWF kind of got how to book this guy. And, um, you know, uh, Shawn, uh, he would take out Shawn Michaels time in and time out with the ankle lock. They really tried to build that up. Shawn Michaels said, though, he was a he was very durable to, to that hold. And, um, yeah, so this led to this uh, Intercontinental Championship match. Not Intercontinental, the WWF title match. Uh, Ken Shamrock made Shawn Michaels tap out time in and time out, proving that he could beat Shawn Michaels for the WWF title. So we had the match. Um, and Ken Shamrock pretty much said that he's going to snap Shawn Michaels' ankle and, win, ankle and win the goal tonight. And Shawn Michaels then said that he's going to cut loose onto uh, Ken Shamrock. We had the match. WWF Championship match. WWF Champion Shawn Michaels with Triple H in China inside versus Ken Shamrock. And this was a pretty good matchup here. I'll, give, um, I'll, I'll probably give it three stars. Um, I I enjoyed the match. Uh, Ken Shamrock destroyed Shawn Michaels in the beginning, but then eventually Shawn Michaels um low blow zone behind the referee's back, clotheslines himself and Shamrock out of the win. Triple H and China take ch cheap shots onto uh, Ken Shamrock. Ken Shamrock tries to make a comeback, and Shawn Michaels continues to cut him down. He hits a splat. Splash from the apron on the outside. He hits an elbow drop off the second turnbuckle right to the spine of Ken Shamrock. And he dominates the matchup for a while. Uh, Triple H and China continuously interfere in the match. Ken Shamrock eventually makes a comeback. He hits a belly-to-back suplex. Goes for the ankle lock. Triple H and China attack Ken Shamrock. And everybody lays him out. Um, and then eventually Shawn Michaels is taunting on the apron. When who comes out? None other than Owen Holt. Owen Holt knocks Shawn Michaels off the apron through the Spanish announcer's table and just starts going to town on him, beating the crap out of him. And Triple H tries to get to him, but Owen Holt takes off through the crowd before um, Triple H can get to him. And afterwards, DX celebrates and Shawn Michaels holds up his WWF title and the show goes off the air. And yeah, obviously, uh, this unfortunately, this, this Owen Holt thing really didn't go anywhere. Owen Holt was trying to get a revenge off Bret Hart after... Uh, being screwed in Montreal after the Montreal screw job, and all this really went to was a European Championship match at WrestleMania with Triple H. They didn't do a match between Shawn Michaels, at least that I recall, anyways, uh, and Owen Hart for the WWF title. Um, so that was kind of lame. Uh, obviously, I already mentioned where Triple H in China went. Ken Shamrock, I believe, you know, eventually won the Intercontinental Championship. And he won the King of the Win and stuff like that. And he was becoming a huge star. But then, fortunately, in 1999, he left the WWF to go back to the UFC. Which was kind of a shame because I think it could have been a nice addition to the corporation once it once that fashion kind of finally started up. Um, Shawn Michaels, um, you know, pretty much uh, uh, was becoming the number one heel in the WWF. Um, unfortunately, he injured his back at the Royal Rumble um, in a casket match with The Undertaker, so he dropped the title to Stone Cold Steve Austin. He retired for four years and um, eventually returned um, in 2002 and had a great feud with Triple H. He had a great return, um, beat Triple H at SummerSlam in a street fight, won the World Heavyweight Championship, and he pretty much had like the best run of his career. He was a much better Shawn Michaels. And... He had, some, he had a great run in 2002 to 2010. He finally fully retired in 2010. And Shawn Michaels had a great career. Unfortunately for Owen Holt, 
Like I said, he wrestled Triple H for the European Championship at WrestleMania, and he pretty much, they turned him into the Blue Blazer, and he, had, um, he unfortunately passed away because of his entrance and from the harness and stuff. And, yeah, Owen Hart has recently passed away. So, yeah, obviously, um, um, th uh, that was pretty much where everybody went. As for this show, I thought this was, and as for whether the WWF went, because this was like, I thought the show actually was decent. Six out of ten, nothing fantastic. I didn't think it was anything great, but it was decent. Uh, it had some like good. It had some decent matches on the show. You could definitely see where the WWF was going with Austin and Rock. Um, you know, definitely with Austin. Uh, maybe not as much Rock at this time, but definitely Austin. But you, you know, um, you could definitely see you know with Undertaker and Kane, Shawn Mike with D Generation X, with even uh, Badass Billy Gunn and Road Dog. So the WWF uh, was looking really good. They were starting to come back after getting their asses kicked by uh, WCW and the Raiders. So I thought that was awesome. And I, um, I loved it. And obviously the WWF definitely did come back because uh, this, uh, this, they were finally in the Attitude Era and they were just starting to get better and better and better. Uh, this show was decent, 6 out of 10. Um, and there's really nothing left to say about it. Um, I would definitely recommend this show. Uh, but that's pretty much it, guys. Thank you guys for watching this video. Please make sure you guys like, comment, and share this video so people will watch it. Make sure you guys subscribe to this video. Uh, video for more content and click on the bell so that way every time you upload a video on this channel you guys will get the notification for it make sure you guys do the same thing for my own the talkinator and cm brothers channel and that's pretty much it guys talk to you later